A few years ago, in 2014, I was working excessively long hours and started to feel super burned out. Eventually, I decided I needed somewhat of a sea change and, for some unknown freaking reason, decided Moscow was a good place to head. So after arranging a teaching position over there and selling a lot of my crap in my home country, I headed over at the end of August. The first six months went by without any incident. Well, there were a lot of incidents, actually, but they're all just funny anecdotes that I'd get sidetracked on, one being a huge bender with the Hells Angels Moscow chapter. You're here for the juicy crap, though. It was a Saturday in mid-March of 2015 and still pretty cold out. I'd finished up my afternoon class and was on my way to meet a friend at a bar slash club near the Pushkinskia metro station. We had a few beers and were talking in English, he's Russian, though, and as day quickly turned to night in our boozy stupor, all of a sudden we had three guys sitting on the couches surrounding us. They sparked up a conversation in English, asking a few questions about where I was from and how long I'd been in Moscow, standard crap, really. They seemed like nice enough dudes, and my Russian mate didn't seem to have any issues with them so we were accommodating. Soon, we were all enjoying shots of top quality beluga vodka their bottle end as one empty turned to two, then three, and four, I can safely say I was completely rat freaked. I woke up very dusty the following morning, hazily remembering the previous night's shenanigans and promising myself I'd never drink that much vodka again. Then, later that evening, I got an SMS from a number that I'd apparently saved in my phone named Anton, saying something along the lines of how are you man? How do you feel? I replied something standard, you feel like crap, etc., and he eventually asked me to join them out that night at the same place. I kindly refused as I had a morning class of kids to teach the next day, and that was that. Thursday was the next time I heard from Anton, again asking me to join them at the bar for some drinks. This time I agreed, as I didn't actually have any classes on Friday, and invited my friend along too. Again, hit the vodka hard. Again, they shouted all night. Again, I woke up like crap. But this time I woke up and had already received a message from Anton. Keep in mind, I'm paraphrasing all of these communications as it was a few years ago now. Anyway, the message said, come to meet us at insert bar name today, meaning Friday. I replied telling him I couldn't drink as I had my class on Saturday and heard nothing back. It's a bit weird, but okay. Saturday afternoon, I was gathering my stuff to leave the school I taught at and had another message. Come to meet us at insert bar name today. I remember it being worded exactly the same as the last message. Not sure why, but I did. Anyway, I thought, yeah, why not? It's Saturday and I have nothing better to do. Freak it. Why not? When I got there, it was just Anton, so he and I got a beer and were chilling out talking crap. But then out of the freaking blue, he said, so you drink our vodka, but you don't pay crap? Just like that. No precursor, nothing. Weird. We'd been joking around just moments before. I asked him what he meant. You know what I mean, you creep, he responded. I told him I'd be happy to shout in shots, and that they had just been feeding them to me the entire time the past nights we'd been out. I never actually asked for them. Anyway, he said no, not enough. You drank say $5,000 of our vodka, you need to pay us back. What the hell, dude? How did you calculate that? No vodka is worth that, I said. He replied, this bar vodka is expensive. I went to the bar and got the menu and checked it to confirm. Nope. There was no way I owed him that. I showed him and still he told me I owed him $5,000. I had crap all money at that stage. I'd spent most of what I'd saved before leaving and I was being paid peanuts at my teaching job. Oh, but you're from the country. You know people who have it. I said, nah, man, nobody would send me that much. Then he looked at me, just stared at me. For a while. It was awkward and super tense. And told me that if I didn't find the money to pay him, he'd kill me. What the hell? I didn't even know what to think. Why would I believe that? Who would do that? 
and this is a guy I'd have what I thought were fun nights out with. So much going through my head. Anyway, he called someone and they came up the stairs into the entrance and sat down and pulled out a gun. Anton again says I know the school you work at. I know your metro station. You don't pay and I will kill you. Sure, I'd shared some info, but I was naive to do so with someone who I didn't really know. They point outside to two cars, both completely blacked out windows, saying there are people in the cars that want my money. Is this real life? This sounds like a freaking joke. Is that even a real gun? I've never even seen a gun in real life, so how do I know? He makes another call. I look outside and watch a huge freaking guy get out of one of the cars and come up and into the bar. He doesn't speak any English, and I don't know what he's saying. I ask Anton if I can call my friend so he can speak to this guy and translate what's being said. It's okay, he says. So I call Dennis and hand over the phone. They talk for about five minutes and when I talk to Dennis again he sounded really freaking shaken up. Man, he says, you gotta freaking pay these guys. They are serious. It's a group of people who will freaking kill you if you don't pay them. What are you talking about, Dennis? I asked. Dude, it's the freaking Russian Mafia. I got off the phone and told them I would get them the money. I was shaking as I left and felt like I was going to burst into tears. I'm actually typing this and feeling a hot flush and anxiety. I was still shaking when I got back to my crafty flat. Still shaking when I called my mom and told her I needed $5,000 sent to me through Western Union. She of course wanted to know why and I didn't want to tell her but, clearly, there was something wrong. I ended up telling her and she was talking about calling the embassy and getting me on a plane out of there. I told her no, that I just needed to pay and that would be it. She did end up sending it to me and I paid Anton. I know not really an epic ending or anything. But to be told you're going to be killed when you're in a different country by probably the most dangerous people I in the country is a very, very scary experience. It all sounds a bit made up, but whatever. I know it happened. Not sure what proof I can provide. Any ideas? Either way, Russian Mafia, let's most definitely never freaking meet again. I grew up in Massachusetts during the 70s. I lived on a relatively traffic-free street and there were always kids to play with so if we weren't at school, we were outside. You came home when you heard your mom calling for you but other than that you were exploring the woods and going on adventures. My brother who was six years older than me would occasionally let me hang out with his friends but for the most part one spent my time with my best friend. There was an old yellow barn that was at the top of the street. It always looked abandoned and my friend and I always wanted to sneak inside and check it out. Both our mothers were very adamant that we were not allowed to go near the barn but never gave us a reason. During the summer we were eight years old and we were bored. We had already ridden our bikes three miles down the road to get ice cream and spent time feeding the ducks. It was while we were riding back to our street I mentioned that I really wanted to take a look in the barn and see what was in it. Michelle was less adventurous than me and was afraid we would get in trouble. I finally managed to convince her to come with me. So right around dusk we went behind the barn and found a very small window that was level with the ground. I was really tiny for my age and knew I could squeeze in it and then find a way to open the door for my friend. So with her pushing me from behind and holding my legs I finally got into the barn. It was dark and had a really nasty, dank, musty smell. I felt my way along the walls until I found the stairs and went up the main floor. It was much lighter in there and I was able to open the door for Michelle. As soon as she got in she was ready to leave, but I wanted to do some exploring so I made her stay with me. It was pretty much a big open room. To the left were the stairs that I came up from the basement and to the right were another set of stairs that lead to a loft. In the big room there were tools and chains hanging on one of the walls, plastic bags scattered around and a chair that was sitting in the corner. Nothing else was in the big room. So we made our way up to the loft. There were shelves that had an assortment of stuff like canned food, empty beer cans and liquor bottles, 
porn magazines, and a few random boxes. I figured it was a hangout for the older teenage boys in the neighborhood so I wasn't too scared. I opened up one of the boxes and it contained bullets. I opened up another small box and in it was a handgun. I thought it was the coolest thing, not worried about why it was there or what it could be used for. By now Michelle was freaking out and totally scared because it was much darker and she wanted to go home. She finally had enough and told me she was leaving. I said I would be coming in a few minutes, I just wanted to look around to see if there were any more treasures to find. To this day, I never really found that little voice of reason that would tell me I was making a bad decision. I heard the door slam shut as she left and continued looking at the contents of the other boxes. The larger boxes contained clothes, wallets, and what I know now to be IDs. I heard the door slam again and was just about to call out to Michelle because I thought she decided to come back when I heard male voices. They didn't sound like boys the same age as my brother but much deeper and raspy. I was able to find a little alcove in the bookcases and move a box in front of it so I could hide. Not going to lie, I was scared. I heard them come up and one of them grabbed the box of bullets and the handgun. He went back downstairs and I heard them talking some more but I didn't really know what they were saying. You could hear a bit of scuffling and what sounded like muffled noise but I had no way to figure out what they were saying or doing from my hiding place. By now I am terrified and trying to figure out how I was going to get out of the alcove without being seen. What I didn't know was Michelle saw the two men pull up and go into the barn. She ran to get my brother and told him where I was and that I was trapped. He went and got a few of his friends and they started to pretend to play hide and seek behind the barn, making noise about splitting up into teams and such. Once the two guys hear that my brother and his friends, they went out back and started to yell at them about it being private property and told them they had to leave. The boys kept the conversation going with them asking if they could stay because it was a great place to hide and by now the men are getting really angry and threatening them. In the middle of the back and forth between the two, I heard my brother yell out my name and scream go. As quietly as I could, I went down the stairs. When I got to the main room, I could see what looked like a big trash bag in the corner. I was wiggling around, and I was so scared I almost screamed out loud. I finally managed to quickly go out the front door and make it to the side. I met up with my brother and his crew, and we started to walk away from the barn. One of the men looked directly at my brother and said, Step foot on this property again, and you will never leave it alive. Some of the boys laughed, but my brother nodded his head seriously and said he wouldn't trespass ever again. It was pretty quiet as we made our way down the now dark street. You could hear some of the parents calling out for their kids to come home. We could hear our mother call out our names, so we separated from the group. I gave Michelle a big hug and swore her to secrecy about what we did. My brother threatened us with severe punishment if we even looked at the barn again. Not to worry. I learned my lesson. He said that he had heard from hushed conversations between our parents that they knew stuff was going on in the barn, but they never mentioned any more to either of us. So years go by and we are all now in our 40s and Whitey Bulger is in the news. People were coming out of the woodwork with stories of his heyday. My brother calls me and asks me if I heard about what happened in our town. He went on to tell me that they found five bodies buried in the old barn that used to be at the top of our street. It was a hideout for his family where they tortured, killed, and buried associates. Had there been a light in the basement of the barn when I went in I may have witnessed seeing them firsthand. I can't tell you how grateful I am that I don't have to live with that sight. And that wiggling garbage bag that I saw when I was on the way out? That may have been one of the deceased they found? I will never know for sure, but it is possible that I could have been trapped in the loft while they executed a man. I asked my father for details, but even to this day he was not forthcoming. Only to tell me that back then it was very bad for your health if you got in the middle of what was going on up there, so it was best to keep your mouth shut and your eyes closed. So that was the summer when I met the Mafia in Massachusetts. In the heart of Little Italy, New York City, where the aroma of freshly baked pizzas and the sound of Italian chatter filled the air, there was a man who lived in the shadows. His name was Vincenzo Moretti, 
a notorious figure in the Italian underworld. He was known for his ruthless nature and his ability to make anyone disappear without a trace. His presence alone was enough to send shivers down the spine of even the most hardened criminals. One evening, I was walking home from work when I noticed a dark figure lurking in the alleyway. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light, but as I got closer, I realized it was Vincenzo Moretti himself. My heart raced as I tried to walk past him without drawing attention to myself, but he had already spotted me. Hey, you, he called out in a thick Italian accent. Come here. I froze in my tracks, unsure of what to do. I had heard stories about Vincenzo and his gang, and I knew that crossing him could mean certain death. Are you deaf or something? He growled, stepping closer to me. I said come here. I reluctantly approached him, my legs trembling with fear. He towered over me, his dark eyes piercing into my soul. What's your name? He demanded. John, I stammered. Well, John, I have a job for you, he said, his voice low and menacing. There's a man I need you to take care of. You do this for me, and I'll make sure you're well taken care of. I knew I had no choice but to agree. Vincenzo Moretti was not someone you said no to. He handed me a photograph of the man he wanted me to eliminate and gave me detailed instructions on how to carry out the hit. As I walked away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I could feel Vincenzo's eyes on me, burning into the back of my head. I knew that if I didn't carry out the hit, I would be the one who ended up dead. That night, I lay awake in bed, my mind racing with thoughts of what I had agreed to do. I had never killed anyone before, and the thought of taking another person's life filled me with dread. But I also knew that if I didn't go through with it, I would be signing my own death warrant. The next day, I set out to find the man Vincenzo had asked me to kill. I followed him for days, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. Finally, I saw my chance. He was walking alone down a deserted street, and I knew that this was my moment. I crept up behind him, my heart pounding in my chest. I raised the gun and took aim, my hands shaking with fear. I closed my eyes and pulled the trigger. But nothing happened. I opened my eyes in confusion, only to see the man standing in front of me, a smirk on his face. Looks like you're not cut out for this line of work, he said, before turning and walking away. I stood there in shock, unable to comprehend what had just happened. It was then that I realized that the man I had been sent to kill was none other than Vincenzo Moretti himself. He had set me up, knowing that I would never be able to go through with it. I knew that I had to get out of New York before Vincenzo's men came looking for me. I packed my bags and left town, never looking back. To this day, I still live in fear of Vincenzo Moretti and the Italian mob. I know that one day, they will come for me, and I will have no choice but to face the consequences of my actions. But until then, I will continue to live in the shadows, always looking over my shoulder, knowing that the shadow of the Sicilian will never be far behind. This happened four years ago. I'm a girl and at the time this happened, I was 12 going on 13 in just a month or two. The friend, Sally, who I was staying with that night was a 14-year-old female who was quite a bit older than me. At least at the time, the two-year age gap was quite big. At 12 to 13 years old, I was about to start my second year of middle school, whereas Sally should have been about to begin her sophomore year of high school. I met her in the beginning of my first year at a new school. She was older than the other kids in our grade and was considered one of the popular kids, and I think that was what drew me to her at first. We became fast friends, and before we knew it, were spending every single weekend together. Seriously. Every single weekend. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. It was your typical Friday night. We carpooled to her family's apartment after school. I've always been a picky eater, so when her family had dinner, I didn't eat with them. I just snacked on the Pop-Tart that I'd stowed away in my backpack in case they ordered something that I wouldn't eat. Something to note is that her family was pretty religious. I wouldn't go as far as to say they were fanatics, 
but they didn't allow their kids to watch horror movies or anything that was rated PG-13 or older. It didn't steam from the desire to protect them from something inappropriate. Sally's mother had an irrational fear that scary movies had satanic messages. We asked to watch The Purge, and her mom obviously said no. After some negotiating, she agreed to let us watch Hunger Games instead. After the movie, Sally and I went to hang out in her room. She put on some music, and being the age we were, we gave each other makeovers. By the end of it, we were looking much older than just 12 and 14. This part of the night is when things started to seem off to me. Sally wasn't the most positive influence. Despite being my best friend at the time, she was manipulative and got off on putting me down. She had a habit of talking to men online and lying about her age. Sally showed me some texts between her and the man she was talking to. I can't give you an exact recount of them, but they consisted of him trying to convince her to meet up with him and just the usual things you'd expect from a creep online. According to him, he was 19, tall, and blonde with soulful blue eyes. Once I saw the texts, I asked if she had a picture of him. Something didn't sit right with me after seeing the messages. She showed me what he looked like, and he was very clearly not 19. This man was at least 40 and looked like he lived in his mother's basement. Then we got a call from him. Sally answered without hesitation, and when I heard the voice on the other end of the call, I felt like I was going to be sick. You're so pretty, why don't you come meet me? He asked. Sally said that she couldn't because she was spending the night with a friend. The mention of that sparked his interest, and then he proceeded to try and ask us both to meet him. Sally, lacking any common sense, said yes. Thus began her plan for us to sneak out and walk 15 blocks to meet him in a deserted McDonald's parking lot. I didn't want to go. I was raised on stories of what happens to teen girls who meet random men from the internet in person. But after adamant pleading from Sally that she didn't feel safe going by herself, I agreed. We took our phones with us for the walk. I had a kitchen knife stuffed in my bra in case something were to happen and I needed to defend myself. The route we had to take to get there didn't have very many street lamps and there weren't any houses. We were surrounded by trees on both sides of us. When we got to the parking lot, the only car parked nearby was a black beat up 2000 Toyota Corolla. The car was still running when we got there, and from what we could tell there was more than one person inside. The man from the picture got out of the front passenger seat and left the door open behind him before approaching us. I turned my flash on so I could see, and he was obviously on something. I can't tell you what kind of drug it was for the life of me, but his eyes were so wide they looked like they were about to pop out of his head. He was jittery and kept twitching. I became very conscious of how big he was. Maybe feet 2 inches, around 280 pounds. For reference, my friend and I did not look our ages, even without makeup. I'm about 5 foot 2 inches. My friend was pretty tall, probably around 5 foot 6 inches. We were both significantly smaller than him. The man reached out for us and caught my friend by the arm. I went to get my knife as quickly as I could, and that's when I saw his friends getting out of the car. He invited us back to his car and offered us booze and drugs, but after seeing my knife and that I was ready to call the police, he released my friend. I took Sally's arm and ran faster than I ever had in my entire life. We took the long way home to avoid them finding out where she lived in case they were following us. Once we got there, her family was still sound asleep. We locked all the doors, closed the blinds, and blocked him on everything. There wouldn't be any sleeping that night, we were constantly peeking out the window, and to our dismay, that same Toyota was circling around her apartment building. Not once, not twice, but three times. I never mentioned any of this to my parents out of fear of getting grounded or in trouble. I'm 16 now, and they still have no clue. I still get nervous when I see a car similar to the one from that night. As for Sally, her parents never found out either. We agreed to never speak about it again. Thankfully, she moved into a new house just a few weeks after that happened. Safe to say Sally and I haven't spoken in three years. She was pissed at me for ruining her night and our friendship didn't last for long after that. We had a pretty bad falling out, 
but looking back on it now, it was definitely for the better. So to Sally, thank you for teaching me a very valuable lesson and making me realize that some people are best just left alone. And to the man and his friends who tried to prey upon two young girls, let's not ever freaking meet again. I'm lucky enough that nothing truly horrible has ever happened to me in my life, and I can't imagine the anxiety and dread faced by those who have endured stalkers, so I won't even try to suggest that my experience comes anywhere close to theirs. I should add that my story may be vague as it was almost 10 years ago, and I also have a way of forgetting details of events that make me uncomfortable. I think that is just how I cope best. I was home from boarding school with a few friends of mine, all female, around 15 to 16 at the time. My parents are very strict, which looking back I love them for, and so simply for the sake of some excitement my friends and I decided to sneak out one night. I lived in a small beach suburb of a small town, and it was a Tuesday night, so there really was no reason to sneak out, but we decided it would be fun to go and spend the night sitting on the beach drinking and talking and refusing to accept that the summer holidays were almost over. To get out of my house unseen, we had to take the fly screen out of my bedroom window and climb out onto the garage roof, which was dangerously slanted. We walked across the garage roof and then jumped down into the bushes of the neighbor's yard, and then we were free. Thinking that the escape itself would be the most exciting part of our night, we headed down to the beach with a towel to sit on and some ancient cruisers, a sweet alcoholic drink that my older sister had left behind and were probably far past their use by date. We sat on the beach and not surprisingly were very quickly bored and considering heading home. I should mention that we were all very well-behaved young girls, and this was probably the most adventurous thing we had done, so in our paranoia of getting caught we had walked a good 20 minutes down the beach away from home and out of sight of houses. As we finished our drinks and started to pack up, one of the girls noticed a light a fair way down the beach from us, closer to home. Even though it was the middle of the night it could have easily been a fisherman or some other logical explanation, but we all immediately felt that sinking feeling of dread. While we decided whether to head home and have to pass the light on the beach, or stay and hope that it went away, we not only noticed that the light was actually getting closer, but also that a second light had appeared in the distance at the other end of the beach, leaving us in the middle of two distant unknown figures. Freaking out a little as 16-year-old girls do, we sat frozen, debating what to do, and genuinely considered hiding in the bushes behind the beach, despite the fact that these unknown people approaching were probably well-meaning. Before we could even make up our minds, we started to hear voices approaching, young male voices yelling and bickering and laughing. The men on one side closed in on us quickly, seemingly surprised to find other people on the beach, but introduced themselves and were charismatic and good-looking, so we were somewhat put at ease. Within minutes, a couple more young men, all in their twenties from the other direction. The second light also came across us and clearly knew the first group, who by this stage had sat down and started talking to us. They said that they were tourists visiting and had nothing better to do so decided to take their drinks to the beach. Looking back I think of how uncomfortable I felt in my gut, but we were just young, naive girls and felt flattered by the attention of older attractive guys. We sat with them for at least an hour, the conversation normal enough, but a few of the guys were getting uncomfortably touchy with us. Hands on our upper thighs, lower backs, arms around us and not letting us go when we were clearly trying to pull away. We tried politely to leave more than once, but each time the guys would beg us to stay or make excuses why we shouldn't leave yet. One of them was playing his guitar and would even promise to play our favorite songs if we stayed. Finally, we had had enough and insisted on leaving, saying that our parents would wake up soon and realize we had snuck out, big mistake telling them that nobody knew where we were but we weren't thinking and just wanted to get out of there. We started the 20-minute walk home along the beach and a few of the guys insisted on walking with us to make sure we would got home safely. The whole walk home was filled with more uncomfortable groping, with us girls even making up fake boyfriends to try and get them to stop without seeming rude. I now see that being polite is a creep's best friend. Despite only three of the guys leaving with us when we started walking home and the rest staying on the beach, we noticed that they had actually all started following as soon as we were far enough away to be mostly out of sight. 
We were all so relieved when my house finally came into view, obviously not wanting them to know where we lived, but we were desperate to get away from them. We hastily said our goodbyes and started walking towards the neighbor's house. Remember we had to go through their yard to sneak back into my house when one of the guys started laughing and shouted. We know that's not where you live. We didn't stick around to find out how he knew that and sprinted into the neighbor's yard and out of sight. Luckily, we made it home safely that night. You are probably thinking that this was the typical I saw a scary person at night and they looked at me funny story, but unfortunately there is more. The next morning we woke up to the beautiful sounds of someone strumming their guitar. It took a moment for the events of last night to sink in, and in fear my friend next to me grabbed my arm. The song being played was You Found Me by the Fray. It was the song she had asked the guy to play for us. Terrified, we all peeked out of my bedroom window to see that same group of guys was staying in a holiday house on the cliff above my house, with a balcony that looks over my backyard and straight into my bedroom window. I don't want to think about how long these guys were watching us in my bedroom, getting changed or laying on my bed laughing. Or worse, sunbaking in my backyard, which we had been doing all summer while my parents were at work. As much as I wish it was a coincidence that night on the beach, I can only imagine them drinking beers on their balcony while they watched us sneak across the roof and then deciding to follow and search for us on the beach. Why else would they split up and comb the beach from opposite ends? So to the creepy guys who thought the perfect end to a summer vacation is stalking 15-year-old girls, let's not meet again. When people say nothing good ever happens past midnight, they say it for a reason. I, along with my girlfriend at the time, and my best friend sneaked out during this summer. We did this quite often, and each time was better than the last. I mean, the first time the three of us did set the bar really low, and it was easy to be beaten. It was about 1.30 a.m., and the three of us were downtown. We have weddings in our town, and as you know, these things go really late. We saw a couple stumbling on the street, dressed for a wedding that was happening that night. We started cracking jokes to each other like the dumbass teens we are, and then out of the blue, I saw the man hit his wife. I'm not sure if they were boyfriend, girlfriend, or husband, wife, but for the sake of simplicity, I will go with the latter. I look over to my girlfriend and buddy and see the look of shock on their faces. The man started screaming at her, saw us, and took off. Instantly, and against my girlfriend's wish, I ran up to the wife that was crying, face down on the ground. My girlfriend and friend were at the end of the street. I told them to give us some space. I'm trained to deal with things like this. I'm in a Navy program and know how to talk to people. She was clearly very, very intoxicated and could hardly talk. I was able to calm her down and asked her what her name was, where she was from, where she was staying, etc. This conversation went on for about 15 minutes, and by now my group had caught up with me and, like I asked, was giving me space to do my thing. She told me where she was staying, but told me she didn't know how to get there and that she was from out of town. I told her not to worry and that everything would be okay. I helped her up and started to walk to where she was staying. It was about a quarter mile away, and when someone has a very difficult time walking it takes a long time just to go 20 feet. Nonetheless, I knew this was the right thing to do and wanted to help. Coincidentally, the police station was right across the street, and thank God for this. I usually check my back when we go out at night because there are some pretty weird people where I live, and I was lucky that I was being that cautious. I turned around to see a man, tall in stature, incredibly muscular, and angry behind us and my friends. I turned to the woman and asked if that was her husband, to which she started trembling and was able to mutter yes. I told my friends to get away from us because I knew things were going to get bad. They went to the other side of the street and I could tell they were scared for me. My buddy has his phone out, ready to call 911, and my girlfriend was shaking. Then this guy was on me and his wife. He was screaming at me for having the audacity to help her and for being near his wife. The entire time, I was occasionally glancing down at his hands when they weren't in my face to make sure they weren't in fists. 
I never said anything to try to start more of an argument, only things like sir you need to step away from me and you need to calm down, the police station is just across the street, things that you would say to avoid getting the crap beaten out of you. I'm a tall guy, I'm 6 foot 2 inches and feel like I am not someone people want to mess with. But I'm under 18, this guy was probably early 30s, about 6 foot 4 inches and 100% muscle. Very, very scary man. I looked down, saw his hands in a fist, and stepped back quickly, keeping his wife behind me. This wasn't smart. Standing in between a drunken man and his wife is a big, big no-no. I mouthed to my friend, get the police right now, and he turned around and sped the other way. The man didn't notice me doing this, so I figured I was good. The police answered my buddy, and he was pointing over to us, but they didn't come out. It took them about five minutes to come out, and by then the guy fled. I told them what happened, and they sent out a search team for this guy. Turns out he was hiding on the road we were on just a little down the way. The police took the woman and escorted her back to where she was staying and kept the man in the station for the night. They thanked me for what I did and told my friends and me that we should go home. We agreed as youth does and went on our way. Moral of this story is, if you see someone who needs help, please help them. It is up to you. Be the hero they need. And to the guy that almost started a fight and probably would have killed me before he stopped. Let's never, ever, meet again. A few years ago, I was in the process of getting a divorce. My wife had left me for another guy, and I was at a pretty low point. My closest friends were her brothers-in-law, and while they stuck by me, and are still like brothers to this day, it felt weird to me at the time to be hanging out with my soon-to-be ex's family. So, I was spending a lot of time alone. I couldn't handle staying at the house all the time by myself, and pretty much any excuse to get out was something I jumped on. Which is how I ended up at a concert at a local bar alone, and where this story really begins. I was actually pretty excited to see this band. They're from our area, but have managed to become pretty big nationally, and they're very popular around here. I showed up early so I could get a seat at the bar and chill rather than have to stand in front of the stage and not have room to move. I ended up waiting for the doors to open with a relatively small group of people, maybe 15 to 20 of us. One of the others waiting at the door was her. She had the look of someone who'd been on some very heavy drugs for years. I could tell she was probably around my age, but she looked at least 20 years older than she actually was. I could also tell she was currently on something and had also been drinking pretty heavily before coming to the bar. She was staggering and slurring her words, but just managed to keep it together enough that they didn't kick her out. She was wearing what I assumed she thought was concert attire, but she honestly looked like a prostitute. A tube top with a way too small jacket over it and an extremely short skirt. This was in February and it was snowing at about 20 degrees. I'm assuming she thought she was hot but frankly, she was disgusting. She was standing with a group of four to five other people, but kept looking in my direction and making me very uncomfortable when I caught her looking at me. Anyway, they finally let us in and I found a spot at the bar where I thought I'd be able to see the stage pretty well, settled in and ordered a beer. This woman and her group wandered around for a bit until it started getting crowded and then ended up standing very near me. She was close enough for me to smell her, stale cigarettes, B.O., and alcohol. Awesome. Once the warm-up band started playing, I managed to enjoy myself. A couple at the bar next to me ended up being pretty cool, and I spent some time talking to them between bands. I had planned on only having a couple of beers since I was alone and had to drive home in the snow, but the guy ended up buying a bucket of beers without asking me and wanted to split it. He'd been cool, so I was like, what the hell? I'll call a cab if I have to. By the time the main band started, I was on my sixth and feeling pretty good. It was at this point that the crack whore started hitting on me. I told her I wasn't interested and she moved back to her group for a couple of songs. It wasn't long before she was back though. This time she started grinding all over me and ended up falling into my lap. I tried to help her off me as politely as I could while hiding my disgust. 
I'm pretty laid back and don't like to be rude to people, so I was still trying to be nice at this point. Unfortunately, instead of taking the hint, she turned and wrapped her arms around my neck and I was forced to stand up and practically dump her off me. If she hadn't had a grip on me, I have no doubt she'd have been on the floor. I forcibly peeled her off me and once again told her I wasn't interested and she sulked back to her friends. The next person who came over was one of the girl's male friends. What's wrong with you man, that girl really likes you. You gay or something? Again, trying to be as polite as possible I replied no, I'm not gay. I'm just not interested, sorry. The two I'd befriended luckily had my back and told the dude to freak off. The girl even told him I was out of that crack whore's league, which definitely made me feel pretty good about myself. He went back to their group and they moved away, and I went back to enjoying the concert and had a great time. After the show, the couple told me they actually knew the band and asked if I wanted to go meet them. Of course, I did. Plus, I needed some time to sober up before going home anyway, so they led me out back where the band's tour buses were. I say tour buses, but they were mostly old RVs. Anyway, got to meet the bands and hung out with them for a bit which was awesome. I was offered more beer and other things of the greener variety, which I declined knowing I needed to go home at some point. It was then that I noticed Crack Whore and her group were still around and they were all staring daggers at me. Three girls and two guys. Once I saw this, I sobered up even faster and finally decided it was probably time to leave since the crowd was getting pretty thin and I definitely didn't want to be there anymore. I walked pretty quickly to my car, which was in a fairly empty area of the parking lot and I could hear the group behind me being belligerent. I jumped in and headed out. Unfortunately, they followed. I could see them get in another car and pull out behind me. It's still snowing and I know I probably still shouldn't be driving even on clear roads, so I'm trying to stay calm and not do anything to get pulled over, but a car full of angry drunken druggies on your bumper tends to make it a bit hard to stick to the speed limit. When I hit the highway and they were still right on my butt, I decided to screw it. I'd rather end up with a DUI than dead, so I started trying to lose them. The roads were slick, but I was in an AWD SUV and they were in an old beater with, presumably, crappy tires. In the first sharp turn I took, I skidded a little on the snow but held it on the road. They were not so lucky. I watched them slide off the side of the road and into the ditch and chuckled to myself victoriously. I'm not heartless though, even when somebody deserves it. I wasn't going to leave five people, possibly injured in a ditch to freeze to death. Plus I was pretty sure they were going to go to jail, so I called 911 and told them about the accident. I didn't stop or mention that they were chasing me though. I did not want to talk to the cops or to go back and have to see them again and I was also pretty sure that while I felt completely sober at this point, I probably still wouldn't pass a breathalyzer myself. So I just made the call and went home. Not sure what ended up happening with them, but I never saw them again despite going to plenty of concerts in the same area since. So, I was going with my parents to a concert. My stepdad is really tall and quite bulky, so he's pretty intimidating, and in this situation I was very thankful for that. Anyways, I was down in the crowd by the stage watching the show when this guy struck up a conversation with me. He looks about mid-thirties and isn't particularly good looking, but not bad looking either. He is just neutral. But I immediately get a super weird feeling from him. I had been talking to excited concert goers all night so I wasn't too put off by his talking to me. We keep talking about this and that when, like, out of the blue he asks my age and who I'm there with. I lied and told him I was 16. I have no clue why I did, but I think it was in like, a tiny form of self-defense. I also told him I was there with my parents. He then asked me if I, a supposed 16-year-old girl, wanted to go to the 21 and over part of the venue and go get a drink with him. I obviously said no, and that I'm okay but thanks for asking. I forgot to mention that the whole time we were talking, he was excitedly looking at my chest then back up to my eyes. 
After I said no to his offer, we kept talking for a minute and he just kept talking about his car or going to the bar or leaving with him, and I just got so creeped out that I said I had to go back to my seat. As I was walking back to my seat, this dude followed me down the aisle. I only notice when I see him speed walking by me then down the aisle. I looked over to see my parents using nuclear warfare with their eyes at this dude. I talked to my parents at my seat, and that's when they say that they had been watching our whole interaction. They said they could feel my uncomfortable vibe from there, and that they could read all over my face that this dude was a freaking weirdo. My mom almost stepped in to get the creep to leave me alone, but my stepdad told her that I could handle this and to let me try to figure it out. And to be honest, I appreciated that. It gave me a chance to learn how to handle pieces of child harassing crap like him. As a brief introduction to provide some background on how this happened, allow me to say that I'm an old school metalhead. I travel around my tri-state area to see various heavy metal shows. The town I live in is a small town with no real musical scene outside of hip-hop and pop music. No venue here has anything I'd like to pay money to see. As such, I'm forced to travel at least an hour or so away to see any shows I'd like to see. This often has me traveling with my wife, usually across the state to see concerts. There's a particular venue we love to frequent, but it's a good three-hour drive away. But it always has great metal acts playing there, many coming in from Europe. When we go to this place, we usually stay in a hotel slash casino that's about three to four blocks from the venue. It's a short walk. This particular night, we just finished seeing Dark Tranquility, a Swedish melodic death metal band. It was about 2 a.m. when we got out of the venue, as we'd stay behind for a little bit afterward hoping to meet either Dark Tranquility or some of the opening bands afterward, as often happens at small venues like this. And we did, so it was a little while after the show before we got out of there. So we leave and begin to make the walk back to the hotel. There are tons of fellow metalheads milling out as well, and it's kind of a general idea for many of us to stay in the same hotel, since it's right around the corner, like I said just a few blocks over. So we're kind of all walking in this large mob. Now, if you're into the heavy metal scene and frequent live shows, you'll know that it's a fairly tightly knit community. We're all there for the same reason so everyone is usually pretty friendly and talkative. Discussing the show past shows, meeting band members, etc. Lots of jovial discussion. I'd had to piss for over an hour at this point, but hadn't wanted to dip into the restroom during the end of the band's show, and afterward, the restroom was packed with a line flowing back out onto the floor. At this point, though, it's hitting me pretty hard as I'd also had a few drinks in the club. So rather than wait till we get back to our room, I decided I needed to stop in at the public restroom down at the bottom of the parking garage and take this piss. It needed to happen. My wife doesn't mind as she said she needed to piss anyway herself. So we split off. I come into the restroom and think I'm by myself so I hit the first urinal there and start to have at it. As I'm about to finish up the door creaks open and this rather large bald fellow comes in. He stops dead in his tracks right in front of the door for a moment and takes me in like he didn't expect anyone else to be in there then goes to the sink as I'm doing the same to start washing his face. I'm washing my hands and he looks over at me with water running off his nose and asks what I'm doing out here so late. I just explained that I'm coming back from a concert without looking at him. He then starts to ask what kind of music. I explained to him it was a heavy metal concert. He kind of shrugs and nods and just says cool. I'm finished drying my hands now and he turns around and grabs my upper arm lightly and says, hey, then maybe you're interested in buying something I have. He starts to rifle through his jean pockets and mumbles that it's there somewhere. I try to politely tell him I'm not interested and need to get back out. He sort of shuffles in front of me quickly, semi-blocking the door. He looks kind of angry at this point and jets out his shoulders. He's probably a good foot taller than me. I'm a fairly short guy, so this isn't really too hard to do, but still. And he says, look man, no need to be rude. Don't be a dick. I again decline, trying to stay polite. At this point, I'm starting to tense up anticipating a scuffle. The problem is, I'm freaking exhausted. 
I just spent the better part of three hours jumping around and smashing my body into other bodies. Quite frankly, I'm ready to collapse. The guy grabs my arm again, this time a little harder, and goes, Hey man, I'm freaking talking to you. My sense of trying to be reasonable has left me at this point, as I'm too tired to give a shit anymore. Knowing I shouldn't, I tell him, man, you're the one being an asshole. I'm tired and just trying to get the freak out of here, so move out of the way. He shoves me, not really too hard, but from the chest and steps in closer to close the gap saying I was trying to be nice, freak you. Are you trying to start shit with me? It runs through my head that while I almost always usually have a pocket knife on me, in case things like this happen to go down, I'm completely unarmed because I knew I couldn't bring the knife with me into the venue club through their security. So I'm preparing for the worst as the guy seems to have hopped up on something, is a good deal bigger than me, and I'm in about zero shape to fight. It's about to get hairy. The guy's blocking my way to the door, as it's a pretty small restroom. And just as I'm thinking this the door creaks again and I hear laughter and talking start to flood in. The guy lets go of my arm and turns around to look as a group of five guys in black t-shirts, studded leather jackets adorned with dozens of band logo patches and jeans stroll into the restroom. One of them is a Hispanic fellow with long, curly dark hair. He sees me and waves and exclaims, ah, dude, what's up? That was a sick freaking show tonight, wasn't it? One of his friends, another Hispanic guy with a shaved head I think took in what might have been going on in here and said, this guy is giving you shit, man, to me I look back to my bald assailant, a worried expression has crossed over his features. Even being a pretty big guy he realizes he's now got five guys at his back, a few of them about his height too. And they're all pretty decked out too, they probably would look pretty intimidating to the average person not at a metal concert. He glances at me for a split second before saying, nah man, we were just talking. I interject quickly, fed up with this jackass, and now we're done talking. Get the freak out of my way. Next time don't be a dickhead. And start to barge past him, pushing him aside. The Hispanic dude with the long hair turns back to me as I'm passing and says, have a good night, man. And I met up with my wife who decided to stay outside for a smoke. She asks what took so long, joking that I had to take a huge shit and I tell her about it as we're going up the elevator into the hotel. We decide to stop at the Inn Hotel bar and grill before returning to our room as we're both kind of hungry. After ordering, we're standing by the counter for a few minutes and I hear laughter and loud voices coming in from the lobby. We turn around and the same group of five guys is coming our way back toward the snack shop and bar and grill. The long-haired guy sees us and goes, Oh, holy shit, dude. Look at this shit, and points to the window looking out the lobby down into the entrance of the parking garage. There's the bald guy down there, laying on the ground and being handcuffed with two police officers over him. One of them has his taser in hand, and its line is connected to the guy's side. He starts to tell me that apparently the guy had stuck around in the restroom as they'd left and one of them went over to a parked police car a few aisles over in the garage after noticing there was an officer in it. They told him that some guy was on something in there and that he'd been acting threatening and kind of shady. So apparently the officer and his partner had decided to step inside the restroom and take a look. As the guys from the concert were going up the elevator to the hotel lobby, they heard some shouting and looked down to see the guy being drugged out of the restroom by both officers. I guess he'd resisted or something, because apparently there had been a scuffle before one of them tasered him, and then as we all saw now, he was getting cuffed and dragged to the police car. We all had a good laugh about it and talked while we waited on our food. Nice guys. I connected with one of them on Facebook, and we still laugh about that guy on occasion. I'd like to preface this by saying that not all mental health professionals are terrible people. Good doctors and medication have saved my life. I also didn't grow up in the US, so if you see something in this story that makes you go that's not how that works, keep in mind that other countries might have different laws. Furthermore, this describes my experiences with staying at a mental hospital, so prepare for triggers. Alright, here we go. I was a troubled kid. I'm kind of a troubled person in general. 
but when I was in my early teens, specifically when I was 14, I was cutting, suicidal, and refusing to go to school. So I was put on a waiting list for a children's mental hospital. I know now that the fact that I was on that waiting list for close to half a year should have been the first warning sign. At the time, I enjoyed being on sick leave from school, which basically meant I got to play The Sims until 6 in the morning for 5 months straight. But when I had to pack my stuff to actually go to the hospital, I, of course, didn't really want to go. I wanted to get help, don't get me wrong, but the idea of being away from home for 6 weeks, which is the standard time they take to analyze and watch you to give you a diagnosis, after which you can choose to pursue treatment, scared me. I arrived at the hospital in tears, my mom carrying my suitcase for me. The nurses noticed that obviously didn't want to stay. Are you here of your own free will? The doctor asked me. I shook my head. They just shrugged it off, saying they could get a judicial decision forcing me to stay there. I never got to talk to a judge, I never got to defend or explain myself, and as far as I know, my parents didn't talk to a judge either. A judge glossed over my medical history and then signed a piece of paper that forced me to stay in this hellhole for six weeks. The contents of my suitcase were searched and I remember feeling like I had just arrived in prison. The first terrifying thing happened on my first night. As a cutter, my arms were in horrific shape. When wounds heal, they itch. I scratched open some of my old scabs and when I went to the nurse to ask for a bandage, everyone went nuts. In their eyes, I had purposely harmed myself. Which they couldn't prove, but okay. So what do you do when a 14-year-old mental patient harms herself? Talk to her? Try to help? Not. Nah. You take away all her jewelry, a necklace from my mom and a bracelet from my ex-girlfriend, who, at the time, I still had very strong feelings for, and send her off to the timeout room. 4. 24 hours. The timeout room was a small room with a big window that could just barely fit a bed. If I had to use the bathroom, I had to ask a nurse to accompany me. And, no joke, at one point I was in the bathroom, with a nurse standing guard in front of the door. She asked if I was doing okay, and I sarcastically responded with, No, I'm cutting myself with the toilet paper. She goes, Really? And rips open the door. Freaking Christ. All of my clothes, including underwear and PJs, were taken from my room and kept in the front office for the time I stayed in the timeout room. So whenever I needed clothes, I had to go up to the front office to ask for them. But apart from having to ask for clothes and bathroom trips, I was completely left alone in that room. No one ever came to check on me. Getting out of the timeout room wasn't a lot better. For the first week or two, I had horrible stomach problems. I would get up multiple times a night to use the bathroom which, by the way, you didn't have one of in your room. You had to walk down the hall to the bathrooms. Because my stomach kept me up all night, I would often not get enough sleep and end up sleeping through the day, which led to me not taking part in group activities. And instead of, I don't know, waking me up, I was irritated at that, and I quote, if I was up all night, roaming the halls, I'd be tired too. What? Do you want me to just crap the bed, or? And because I didn't partake in group activities, I couldn't earn outside time. Yes, I had to earn going outside. Even just sitting on the front steps with a nurse right next to me had to be earned. So for the first six weeks, I was effectively locked up, except for school and weekends, where I was allowed to go home. It was blatantly obvious that none of the nurses really cared about any of the patients. They weren't even real nurses. They were more like prison guards. One of them straight up looked like a homeless guy. Another sounded like she'd been a five packs a day smoker her life and all, and I mean all, of them were chain smokers. Every free second they had they'd use for smoke breaks. Right outside the door, too, with the doors open, so that all the other kids who were currently going through nicotine withdrawals could smell the cigarette smoke. I saw a real nurse once a week. She mainly checked for self-harm. One time, I self-harmed at home over the weekend. I told her my pet bunny did it. And she believed me. Within six weeks of staying at the mental hospital, I saw a psychiatrist a whooping two times. Once for a general introduction and once for an IQ test. Oh, 
And did I mention that you were allowed to have a razor in the shower? Or the huge bird spider that sat in the corner of one of showers for the entire time I stayed there? Or the cobwebs and silverfish that were everywhere? Anyone who's ever struggled with mental illness probably knows that sentences like just pull yourself together or get over it are the least helpful things one could say to a mentally ill person. I've never heard it that much in my entire life. There was one instance where another patient, who was deadly afraid of spiders, came running out of her room in a borderline panic attack because she had woken up to a spider directly in front of her face. Know what they told her? Don't be such a baby, it's just a spider. They gave her a broom for her to get rid of the spider herself. Which obviously, she couldn't do. My roommate and I ended up helping her. Both of us were scared of spiders as well, mind you. But possibly the most outrageous thing happened on my second to last day. Someone had told the guards that I had smuggled in a razor blade. So they pulled me out of breakfast and searched my body from top to bottom, stripping me naked. With the door to the nurse's room wide open. When they didn't find a razor blade on me, they tore apart my room. They didn't find one there either, but found one laying on the floor in the hallway. It was even still in its wrapper. I wasn't the only patient who cut herself. As a matter of fact, I don't think there was a single female patient who didn't cut herself. That blade could have belonged to anyone. They had no proof it was mine. But of course, it was deemed that it was mine. And despite me not having any new cuts on my arm, I was thrown into the timeout room for another 24 hours. Literally my last 24 hours. And they paid so little attention to the timeout room that a fellow inmate was able to slip a letter with a razor blade inside under the door so I could take out my frustrations on myself. In case any of you were wondering where my parents were in all of this, my mother wanted to get me out of that place as soon as she heard about the timeout room. But since my parents had joint custody, she needed my father to agree to it. My father deserves a let's not meet story for himself, but to make it short, he hadn't talked to me in over four years, but was somehow convinced that I needed help and refused to get me out of there. My final diagnosis from that place? Narcissistic neurosis. I was 14. And to this day, I have no idea how they came up with any kind of diagnosis, considering I had seen an actual doctor a total of two times. Additionally, this result was delivered to us, my parents and I, by the head doctor of the hospital, who I had never seen in my life, during a conclusive meeting on my last day. I was offered to stay and start behavioral therapy, but I guess it goes without saying that I politely declined that offer. Every therapist and psychiatrist I have talked to since has disregarded that diagnosis entirely. Some have even laughed at it. I'm currently diagnosed with bipolar disorder slash depression and a panic disorder, and my current psychiatrist has suggested I might suffer from borderline personality disorder. I guess the moral of this story is to always do research on the hospital you plan on getting yourself admitted to. I sure hope I never have to see any of the guards, nurses, or doctors ever again. I was a 22-year-old female who worked at a popular theme park for several years while also attending college and holding down two other jobs at the same time. I seemed to get sick a lot during this period of my life. In hindsight, I now realize that it was likely due to not sleeping much, eating well, drinking enough water, and being exposed to hundreds of people on a daily basis. On a busy weekend, I picked up a late shift to make a little extra holiday pay. I had been assigned to an area with a lot of guest flow, and the three to four of us running that spot were getting overwhelmed rather quickly. At some point, while trying to tell a guest he couldn't stay where he had parked his family, the guest got confrontational. I had been assaulted by park goers before while working, so I completely froze up. This guest was in my face, screaming about how I was ruining his vacation, when I saw a shadow appear from behind me. A very large man in a similar uniform to mine was standing behind me, staring down the belligerent guest. Behind him was another large man, same uniform, telling the guest that he needed to move on or they would call security. I was so relieved. The guest left, and the two men stayed near me the rest of the evening to make sure I wasn't bothered again. The second co-worker, Mac, asked me all kinds of questions about my life and where I usually worked. 
I was so grateful for their support, I think I answered his questions for the next two to three hours while we finished up our shifts. At the end of the evening, Mac asked for my phone number, and I gave it to him. He wasn't really my type, but I figured it was the least I could do after how much he and his friend had helped me. We ended up going on a date about a week later. It wasn't a very long date, and I realized pretty early on that I still really wasn't interested in him as anything more than friends. When we went to part ways, Mac asked when he could see me again. I tried to gently turn him down as nicely as possible, telling him I would be up for being friends, but nothing else. He protested, begging for one more date, and I could tell that he was pretty angry. I shook my head again, apologizing profusely, not wanting to be rude. His face was flushed with anger by now, and he forced a too long hug on me before I could walk away. It was a big theme park, and we didn't normally work in the same area, so I left feeling some relief at knowing I probably wouldn't see him again. My phone started going off constantly. Text after text, paragraphs asking for another chance. Telling me that we were meant to be and that our meeting had been fate. He really did think that he was my knight in shining armor and could not seem to understand why I wasn't interested. After countless messages back telling him I really didn't see him that way, I finally blocked his number. About a week later, one of my zone co-workers came up to me asking if I was dating a manager in another area. Mac had evidently been telling people that he and I were going steady. I vehemently denied it to my co-worker and to several others that came up to me throughout the day. A few days later, I saw him waiting near the entrance to the payroll office, seemingly looking for someone. Before I could think to avoid him, he spotted me and ran up to say hello. I remember his eyes being too wide, smile just a little off-putting. He repeatedly said how much he had enjoyed our date, that he couldn't wait for the next one. There were lots of people walking around nearby, so I mumbled that I still wanted to just be friends and pretended that someone walking by was my roommate. Told him I had to go so I could get a ride home. His face contorted with anger again, and he tried to grab my arm, saying he would give me a lift home, but I dodged. Before he could try again, I slipped into the crowd. I remember feeling my heart banging against my chest and kept checking behind me the entire walk to the parking lot. He just stood outside the payroll office, his face red, staring at me as I walked away. A few days later, I was sick again. I got on antibiotics, but my body had, unknown to me, developed an immunity to that brand of medication. I kept taking those pills for a week, not understanding why I was just getting worse. My roommate finally came home from work one afternoon to find me literally gasping for air from my bed. She rushed me to the ER, where they admitted me for a high fever and pneumonia. That first night, after being admitted, one of my lungs collapsed. The hospital told me that I was going to be there for a while. My roommate only told a few of our close friends that I was in the hospital. They visited when they could, bringing me books to read and keeping me updated on work. One told me that a manager from another zone had been stopping by almost daily to see if I was there. I felt my blood run cold and my heart rate ticked up on the monitor by my bed. I tried to sleep while I could after they left. But between the machines, the nurses checking in every hour, and worrying over Max seeking me out, I could only manage hazy naps. The next day, I was woken up from one of these sporadic naps by a knock at the door. Except for a nurse, I tried to sit up completely, but didn't have the energy. Through sleepy, blurred vision I saw a large man enter the room. It was a Mac. I felt my heart start pounding again. He was carrying flowers and had that creepy smile on his face again. I was literally stuck, couldn't move to get away, and no one was around. The nurse call button on my bedside was broken. The nurse had already warned me about it, saying they would just be monitoring my vitals from the desk closely until it could be fixed. I could not believe that he was here. How did he even find out that I was here? He came and sat next to the bed, grabbing my hand in a too tight grip. He told me that he was worried after not seeing me at work anymore that he wanted to check on his girl. The heart rate monitor was beeping pretty steadily now and must have triggered something at the nurse's station. 
I still couldn't breathe very well, long-winded speech was hard, and I was internally freaking out, so I was just replying to his chattering and questions with quiet, single-syllable words. After what felt like an eternity, but must have only been a few minutes, a nurse walked in. Max's grip on my hand grew even tighter, prompting something akin to a squeak from me as my hand felt crushed in his. The nurse must have seen the look on my face, and after a split-second glance between Mac and I, she asked him to step out so she could check me over. He dropped the flowers on the table and grudgingly walked out of the room. Before the door shut, he looked back at me and said he'd come back as soon as she was done. When the door closed, the nurse asked if I was okay. I shook my head no. She asked if I wanted him to come back. I managed a raspy not at all. She didn't pry, didn't ask, but told me that she would take care of it. Grabbing a quarantine sign out of a cabinet near the entrance to my room, she hung it on the outside of my door. I heard him arguing with her for five to ten minutes before it finally got quiet again. She told me afterward that he had finally left and that she made a note at the nurse's station not to let him in again. I thanked her and asked if she could throw the flowers away outside the room. Just looking at them was giving me the creeps. I was there for another two weeks. They didn't want to release me too early given my medical history. I asked my roommate to pick up a gift card the day before I left so I could give it to the nurse who had been so kind and perceptive during my stay. I didn't return to work for another two to three weeks after that. My lung capacity took another month to fully be back to what it was before. When I got back, I asked a couple of friends of mine if they had told Mac that I was hospitalized and where I was hospitalized. There were several large medical centers in the area. I didn't think he could have found out by calling every single department. They said they had only told our head manager that I was there when she asked why I'd been gone for so long. I now assumed that he found out from her. I spent the next several months looking over my shoulder and scanning rooms before entering. I thought I spotted him sitting in his car in our lot a few times, but was never 100% sure. I made sure I was never alone going out to my car in the evenings. I eventually found out that he'd been forced transferred to another park for reasons no one was told. I hadn't said anything to HR, so my best guess was something other than his apparent interest in me. I never saw him again. So, stalker ex coworker Mac, let's not meet again. I'm an EMT, and I have been for about three years now. I live and work in Southern California, and this particular transport happened when I was a brand new EMS worker for four months at a private ambulance company. This company was a private basic life support, BLS, company primarily, meaning we typically transported patients whose care provider had a contract with us. However, sometimes we would run 911 calls out of prisons. This is where our story begins. It was late into the night at our station when I heard the tone from my radio, Unit 221 Priority Response to State Prison for an Unknown Medical. Copy, wheels up in two, I replied. I walked over to my partner who was sleeping on our wreck area couch. Rise, sweet prince, a life needs saving, I sarcastically exclaimed. We hopped into the rig, the engine roared to life, and we set off, lights blazing, sirens wailing. As we approached the prison, we killed the lights and sirens and proceeded with the routine security check. Once the guards were satisfied with the search, we were given access and led through the gates and parked outside the medical bay. Gurney and medical equipment in tow, we entered the prison hospital. Now because my partner was the patient person for the last call, I was going to be the primary care provider for this patient. Now, though I had been a pretty new EMT, I had done a lot of prison transports in a small period of time. I've had inmates scream at me, try to bribe me, and yes, even try to kill me. So as you can imagine, I really wasn't looking for fight night on Unit 221 at 4 in the morning. Regardless, I always prepared for the worst. We were escorted in by guards as usual and led into the main area of the hospital's rooms, which were still fitted as cells. I was approached by a nurse who gave me a sheet of paper with his information and most recent vitals. I began to ask for the turnover report and why this patient required transport and where we were transporting to. The nurse stared blankly for a moment, 
before he said, you're going to Scripps Mercy Shores Hospital Room 329, he's going because he doesn't feel well and he needs some tests done. He shouldn't be a problem for you. Already a few silent alarms were going off in my head. Scripps Mercy Shores is a rich people hospital. I have never heard of anyone other than someone wealthy going there, let alone a prisoner. Second, not feeling well and needs tests don't really paint me a great picture for why he needs to go and what I'll be dealing with. And finally, what does he shouldn't be a problem for you mean? If he's a violent inmate or even an at-risk patient, they'd normally just say so. Getting an actual report on this patient's health and medical condition was like getting blood from a stone. I decided to just relent and go ahead with the transport. The prison guards brought the shackled patient out to us, another oddity, every other time I'd go in and talk with them before getting them onto the gurney. Standing before me was a tall, rather frail-looking man of dark complexion. His eyes were red and sunken. His overall demeanor was a fearful one. He was constantly shivering. He looked like hell. I introduced myself and began my whole checklist of things to ask and address. We'll call him David. He answered all my questions with a small and quivering voice. When I asked what the problem was tonight, he gave a quick and frightened glance towards the guards and the nurse. I don't feel well. His reply sounded forced and rehearsed. Abuse from the staff came to mind first, but I'd address that later. I decided to just go ahead and get this guy going and I'd wrap everything up in the ambulance. Before loading him in, I asked him the same question I asked all inmate patients. Be straight with me and I'll be straight with you. Are you going to cause problems once we get going? He quickly shook his head no and we were off. When transporting prisoners, one guard accompanies the ambulance and another follows in what's called a tail car. This is for everyone's safety and ensuring that if the patient tries anything, an official guard is there to address it. I was busy writing up my report when I realized that between the confusion of the call and the late hour, I had forgotten to get my own set of vitals. A rookie mistake. We were about halfway to our destination and the patient had remained silent this whole time. I told him I was going to take his vitals and instructed him to give me his arm so I could begin. He did so immediately, like he was trained to obey anything demanded of him, and did so with that haunting look of fear. I wrapped my blood pressure cuff around his arm and that's when I felt him for the first time. His skin was ice cold. There wasn't even a slight warmth to his skin. I asked him if he'd like a blanket, but he declined. I continued with my evaluation, I inflated the cuff, pressed my stethoscope to his brachial artery, and listened for the pulse to come back to show me his blood pressure. It didn't come back. At first I thought my stethoscope was broken, so I grabbed a spare one, same result, no pulse. I removed all my equipment and felt for his pulse myself, nothing. I looked at him and asked if he felt alright. He replied with a simple, quiet, I'm okay, thank you. Caught off guard, I grabbed my pulse oximetry, which is used to find a heart rate and blood oxygen level, and put it on his finger. After a moment of the machine reading, the heart rate came back at zero, and the blood oxygen level came back at zero. My heart dropped. I took another set of vitals to see if I misread anything, but they all came back the same. Heart rate, zero blood pressure, zero blood oxygen level, zero the only thing consistent was his respiratory rate, which was 24 breaths a minute. A bit higher than the resting rate, but not alarming in itself. I looked back again and asked him once more if he's okay. He looked me in the eyes and nodded his head yes as tears welled up in his eyes, then looked away. He was completely alert. He responded perfectly to all my questions. His eyes were equal and reactive, all signs of good brain function, but no signs of a pulse or any vascular activity. At this point, I don't know what to think. Scientifically, there is no reason this guy should be alive. Even if he had an artificial heart, he would be showing vital signs and have a battery pack with a filter kit. But he's right in front of me, alert, breathing, talking when addressed, it makes absolutely no sense. I decided to continue investigating. I listened to his heart with my stethoscope. There was no beating. No thumping. Just the muffled sounds of his breathing. 
While I was there, I listened to his lungs, all clear. I had just finished listening to his chest when we pulled into our destination. We offloaded him from the ambulance, took him to the room we were instructed to, then he hopped off the gurney and was escorted to his hospital bed by the guards. I began giving my almost unbelievable turnover report to the nurse, who surprisingly didn't seem alarmed by any of it. I wrapped up my turnover and then sat down in a nearby chair to finish up my report. As I sat, typing away at my computer, I was interrupted by the sound of a hospital gurney rolling down the hallway. It was accompanied by four people in surgical gowns who entered the inmate's room with said gurney. After a few minutes, the team in surgical attire emerges from the room, the inmate strapped down to the gurney with restraints, audibly crying, and wheeling him down the hall and around the corner. That was the last I saw of him. I told my partner once we were back in the ambulance, he didn't believe me at first, which I can understand, I joke around a lot. But with the look I gave him, I knew I wasn't kidding. This story may not have been what you were expecting, it's not violent or particularly frightening, but this was hands down the most disturbing call I've ever had. I don't know what I saw. I don't know what I transported. I have my theories, such as experimental treatments being carried out on inmates. But with skin like ice, hardly any vital signs, and such a fearful demeanor, I can only wonder what kind of experiments, and what kind of horrors, that man had faced.